Riding an overweight adventure bike through tough terrain feels a bit like trying to straddle a drunken moose, and I fear the moose might actually handle better. But what if you didn't have to struggle? What if you could take an enduro bike and with the right modifications, turn it into an absolute weapon of an ultralight adventure bike? And in this video, we're gonna talk about four of the best platforms to start on your journey of turning your enduro into an ultralight unicorn. The bike we're gonna start with is from Team Red and that's the Honda CRF 450 RL, which is a pretty obvious choice for this category. This is by far the heaviest bike of the bunch at 132 kilos, but that is a good and a bad thing. If you're wanting the lightest of the bunch, it's a bad thing, but if you're wanting stability out on the open road and we are turning this into an ultralight adventure bike, then that is a positive. The engine itself is fantastic, making 42 horsepower and about 30 foot pound of torque. So plenty of power for both on and off-road performance. You can get the front wheel up, no problem. Those of you in Europe, take note, you get the restricted version, so it doesn't make that much power straight off the showroom floor. You will have to get it to US spec before it makes full power. It also comes with a fairly decent wide ratio six B gearbox, which is exactly what we need for ultralight adventure riding. The suspension on the 450 RL is pretty decent, which is one of the benefits of going with these enduro motorcycles, is the fact that you're getting competent suspension straight out of the box. You don't really have to do too much to it. So we have 300 millimeters of travel, which is excellent. And we also have a fair amount of adjustability. The oil changes on the Honda are also pretty great considering the company it's in. Every 2000 kilometers is what the manufacturer asks. And if you listen to the owners of these bikes, that can be pushed even further, like all of the bikes on this list. How far? That's up to the rider and the type of terrain you're doing. So this bike, you really could do multi-day trips without any modifications to the engine, which really lends itself to being an ultralight adventure bike. On top of that, this comes with a proper subframe. So you can strap your soft luggage straight to this bike with no modifications and it can handle the weight. I wouldn't go crazy, but the fact that it has a subframe is a plus and one of the reasons this does weigh a little more than the rest. It's also great value for the segment. While it it is an expensive bike for an off-road Honda. It is fairly affordable compared to most enduro bikes like KTMs and Husqvarna's. The downside is that I've ridden one and the fueling isn't great in first gear. To get past the Euro emissions, they've done some funny things to the first gear. So it is quite easy to stall this bike because it just cuts off the revs as soon as you back off the throttle. It's an easy fix, but it's an expensive fix. So you need a Vortex ECU replacement. That fixes all those issues, but it also means forking out a considerable amount of money, which kind of negates the savings you will have over a KTM to start. Of course, on the plus side, that means you'll be able to get more performance out of the motorcyclist, especially when you fit a pipe and a filter kit to this bike as well, if you're inclined to do so. And of course, being a Honda, there's going to be piles and piles of accessories available for this bike to turn it into your ultimate ultralight adventure bike. Honda have also paid attention to how much road noise this bike makes, and they've tried to reduce it in order to reduce fatigue. So you've got rubber mounted final drive sprockets on this bike to keep the bike quieter. You've also got hollow sections in the swing arm, which have been injected with a rubber compound to also reduce vibrations and noise. And you've got engine covers on this bike that have also got some sound deadening material in them, all to keep the bike quieter and reduce fatigue. I think the key features that make the Honda stand out from the other bikes I'm going to list today are the parts availability. Wherever you are in the world, you should be able to get your hands on parts for this bike. On top of that, there's the perceived reliability, as I mentioned with the Honda. And lastly, road comfort. I think this bike has the most concessions made within these four bikes. I think this is the most comfortable out on the open road. <laughs> The next bike is the Beta 390RR. I've chosen this over the 480 because I really think the 390 is a sweet spot in the Beta range. And this also offers an option to the guys that know they don't need a 500 or a 450. The 390 is that sweet spot for some people. And this is my pick of the litter. 107.5 kilograms dry is very light. It also has a reasonable seat height for an enduro motorcycle at 940 millimeters. And despite having a very good seat height for an enduro bike, it still has plenty of travel and fantastic suspension. So the travel is roughly 295 millimeters up front and 290 at the rear, with all the adjustability you would expect out of an enduro motorcycle. 
And depending on what country you're in, these are actually pretty decently priced. Here in Australia, they're a good three or $4,000 cheaper than the KTM equivalent. So what makes the Beta 390RR such a great option for a lightweight adventure bike? Well, I think that motor is the highlight of the bike. It's really user-friendly, being that it's not a big 500 thumper. Power is just perfect in my eyes. It's not too much, it's not too little. It's also a very long stroke motor, so you get that tractor factor, plenty of bottom end down low grunt and off-road that's exactly what you want and the other factor that makes this unique and quite good as an ultralight adventure bike is the fact that this is the only bike in this list that has a separation of the engine and transmission oil it means a higher overall oil capacity which means it has longer intervals between having to replace that oil so it's up to about 30 hours or roughly 2,000 kilometers which is the same as the Honda which is very very good except that this 390RR is almost 20 kilos lighter the other advantage of having two separate oil compartments in the motor is you might have to carry less oil with you on a multi-day trip. Like many of the modern enduro bikes it also has a pretty decent wide ratio 6B gearbox which is exactly what we want. And another thing that really lends this bike to being an ultralight adventure bike is the suspension isn't quite as harsh as you would find on some of the other enduro bikes. And soft is probably the wrong word, plush is probably the right adjective to use here and I really think it lends it Itself to that ultralight adventure riding because the suspension isn't quite so harsh which means you're getting less fatigued but it can still take the bigger hits off road. One thing that does need to be pointed out though is that this has an oil pump gear that is plastic so you can only do about 100 hours on those before having to change it out. I would suggest you getting one of the metal gears that is readily available and you never have to worry about the thing again. The electrics on these bikes isn't quite up to scratch compared to the other bikes on the list. Beta are a little bit more sloppy so you might need to go over the bike and cable tie some loose wires maybe waterproof some connections as well so with the low seat height lightweight decent service intervals and usable low down power it has all the makings of a great formula for an ultralight adventure bike Next up, we've got the bike that is the most popular bike for this segment, and that is the KTM 500 EXEF. It almost feels silly discussing this bike because it is so popular as the base for an ultralight adventure bike. Whether it's Round the World Paul or the countless others on ADV Rider that have chosen this bike to travel around the world, it really has proven itself as a fantastic platform. The 500 EXE hasn't been listed with official power specs, but it's somewhere in the ballpark of 40 horsepower but that 500 makes plenty of torque and is generally why so many people choose it over the other KTM EXEFs in the range because of the motor and that wide ratio 6 speed gearbox of course. With 300 millimeters of travel up front and 310 at the rear with WP Explorer shocks with all the adjustability you could want the suspension is no slouch either and by some wizardry at KTM they've managed to get this bike in at 105 and a half kilo dry. I'm not sure how they did it but boy is that a light motorcycle. So if you're wanting a big bore thumper that'll do wheelies for days this is the motor for you. But if you're a shorter rider you might need to invest in a step ladder because you've got 960 millimeters for the seat height so it is a very long legged motorcycle. And all those things are fantastic for making this a great platform for an ultralight adventure bike but the downside with the KTM is it does require shorter service intervals than the others in the manual. So it states that it needs the oil changes at 15 hours rather than at 30 hours like the Honda or the Beta. Of course, like the others, depending on how you ride it, you can extend that out. And plenty of people have shown that you can ride the KTM and service it at a roughly the same schedule as the Honda or the Beta, and in some instances, push it even further. And the other benefit is there are plenty of engine cases that allow you to hold more oil in the KTMs, which is a real benefit that's a little harder to find for the other motorcycles. And while like all these bikes, the KTM doesn't have a cush drive rear hub, it does have an interesting clutch design. It has bushings in the clutch basket that sort of act 
like a Kush drive in a lot of ways, absorbing some of that vibration. Whether it's a full replacement for the Kush drive rear hub, it remains to be seen. But the fact that KTM have done this is a little bit of a nod to comfort for an ultralight adventure bike. I think the key features that set this bike apart from the others on the list is one, the accessory market, which is massive for the KTM 500 EXE. Also the knowledge base on how to turn these bikes into ultralight adventure bikes. There's so much information out there on how to do it for this specific bike. You will always find a KTM 500 EXE on the second hand market, which is another benefit. And lastly, there's no replacement for displacement. Some people have just got to have that big ball thumper. stick with the 300 model here because I've covered a 450, I've done a 390 and a 500 at this point. So let's round it out with the 300cc model. The RS300R weighs in at a claimed 107 kilos and you can reduce that weight even more by replacing the dual muffler system with a single arrow slip on. The suspension is on par spec wise with all the other bikes you've seen, 300 millimeters up front and 295 millimeters at the back. This is KYB suspension. The ride is definitely softer than a modern enduro bike but as i was talking about with the beater it is a benefit if you're wanting a bike that isn't so harsh and high performance this can lend itself to being more comfortable which is appealing if you're trying to turn the bike into an ultralight adventure motorcycle the seat height is very similar to the ktm here it's 963 millimeters so it's the second tallest of the bunch so if you're a shorter rider you might want to pay attention to that it is a little taller than a lot of enduro bikes on the market. Now that six speed gearbox, but disappointingly, it does have a fairly close ratio. You tend to run out of steam at about 100 kilometers an hour on these bikes. That can be fixed with a sprocket set. So I've heard that a 14 or even a 15 tooth sprocket can be really good to unlock these bikes on road performance. And the performance of these motors really shines in the bottom and mid range. The accessory market is better than what you might expect from a small manufacturer because these are basically the old Husky Husqvarna TE310 and TE510. There's plenty of accessories still on the market. And while the dealership network might be a bit of a challenge and the gearbox isn't quite as wide ratio as would be hoped for for an ultralight adventure bike, the price of this bike is so competitive that it makes it a very difficult bike to pass on. And if you are on a budget and you want enduro performance and that ultralight weight, then this really should be at the top of your list. Now that we've identified four fantastic platforms for ultralight adventure riding. It's time to reach deep into those pockets, or maybe sell that second kidney because to get these bikes to where they need to go, you got to start modifying. And until next time, guys, don't forget to stay shiny side up and I'll see you in the next one.